Hi, welcome to Mormon Scripture Explorations again. I'm continuing my explorations of the Book of Mormon, and today we'll look at 1 Nephi, Part 2, which will cover verses 5 through 20. The, after the introductory material that Nephi provides in the first few verses, he launches immediately into Lehi's visions. Essentially, uh, Lehi is the catalyst, and his visions are the catalyst for the departure of the Lehite colony, which lays the foundation for the Book of Mormon. Now, Lehi himself, the, the name Lehi is an authentic ancient Near Eastern name. I've listed uh, several uh, publications on the matter in the Purple Zone. So just note that uh, the Book of Mormon is coming up with names that it claims comes from the uh, ancient Jewish setting in the 6th century BC, and in fact, the first ones we've got are all authentic. Um, Lehi, Lehi's situation begins when he hears other prophets prophesying in Jerusalem. And he is essentially wants to know if, if those prophets are right and what he should do because of it. So he, he is said to have prayed with all his heart in verse 5. And when he does so, a strange thing happens, very strange. A pillar of fire dwelt or rests upon a rock before him. Now this concept of a pillar of fire is based on Exodus 14.24. And uh, probably relates also to the burning bush of Exodus 3, 2. The pillar of fire represented the presence of the Lord at the tabernacle throughout the Exodus. So notice an Exodus motif begins. The pillar of fire guided uh, the Israelites on, the, on their Exodus, and it will launch and guide the Lehites on their Exodus as well. Now, what exactly happened is not made clear in the text, and that's an interesting thing about uh, 1 Nephi chapter 1, is that it has all sorts of allusions to things that appear in, the, uh, in Jewish culture, and it just alludes to them in a couple of words in a verse. And um, when we examine these and look into the details of them, we find that they represent a number of authentic ancient uh, Jewish beliefs and practices in esoterica. Now, the pillar of fire um, might have been like an altar. It's not quite clear. There's an altar mentioned in uh, 1 Nephi 2.7. Uh, there's also a thing that's often called a pillar, which is the matzeba. This is a sacred stone that was raised up as a marker of, of some type of theophany, and maybe the pillar of fire is, is associated with this pillar or maseba of stone, and they were, they were rocks, generally speaking. It may have reference to some type of mountain he climbed. Uh, but remember, he's dwelling at Jerusalem. And the text says that he went forth and he prayed to the Lord. Now, the Lord is, of course, Yahweh. So, so he's going to somewhere to pray. Now, as a general rule in ancient Jerusalem in the 6th century, uh, prayer could be conducted anywhere, but a special prayer a very important prayer, you would go to the temple and make that prayer. Remember, he lives within a few minutes' walk of the temple. Jerusalem was not a very big town back then. You could get there from anywhere in the city within 10 or 15 minutes. So, so the assumption here is that if he wanted to make a special prayer before or the Lord, he would go to the temple. And that's what I think is going on here. And the rock on which the pillar of fire appears Maybe the rock of the within the dome of the rock, which was called the Eben Shatia by the ancient Israelites, the the stone of the foundation stone. But uh, my assumption here is that Lehi goes to the temple, and he sees the kabod, the glory of the Lord, manifesting itself as a pillar of fire, just like it did to the ancient Israelites, and he receives this revelation at the temple. So this is a temple theophany. Lehi's first vision is a temple theophany in which the Lord manifests himself, his kabod, his glory, as this pillar of fire. Now, we don't learn the details about what Lehi learned in this first vision. It's just that he heard and saw much. And this is part of what Nephi calls the mysteries of God. The things that the Book of Mormon doesn't tell us in relation to the mysteries of God is often just as important as what it does tell us. 
we've got to bear, bear this in mind. The Book of Mormon is often reticent about certain things, which we may get other places, but at any rate, whatever, these, uh, whatever he heard and saw were part of the mysteries of God that the Book of Mormon talks about. Well, after this vision, Lehi returns home and he's in, uh, overcome by the Spirit. He's overwhelmed and he collapses on his bed. Now, within his house then, in his bedroom, he has his second vision. And if you want more information about that, you can take a look at this article by Welch, The Calling of Lehi, In G, uh, GLJ is the um, Glimpses of Lehi's Jerusalem. I use this abbreviation system, and again, the abbreviations can be found in the bibliography on my webpage in the file called Abbreviations. And then I include links like this, uh, which are active in the notes that are also posted on my webpage. Essentially, what you see here on the screen in the videos, you have a full PDF version of these in notes, and these um, uh, links, the hyperlinks, are active on the notes. Okay, Lehi then goes to his house, and there in his bedroom he has a second vision. Uh, in this, he's carried away. Uh, and it's not quite clear where he's going, but he's having a vision, and he sees the heavens open. Now, this is all code language for celestial ascent and an apocalyptic revelation of God in heaven. So we're seeing language related to a celestial ascent. He's carried away. He's carried away into heaven, and the heavens open before him. So he's ascended into heaven. And then when the heavens open, it is always to reveal... Uh, uh, apocalyptic knowledge or, or mystery knowledge. And that's exactly what, of course, Lehi gets in this. Now, his vision is of God seated on a throne. And this is very interesting because it, again, is another standard ancient uh, Jewish uh, phenomenon we call the throne theophany. And I've listed on the uh, right hand here a number of biblical passages where throne theophanies are described. Uh, on the left-hand side are listed uh, uh, some articles which also talk about this, especially the Osler article, and some additional information summarized there as well. So, when, he, when, you, when a visionary sees the heavens open and he sees God seated on his throne, biblical scholars, these are not Mormons, these are just ordinary biblical scholars, call this a throne theophany, and this is a classic example, absolutely classic example of a throne theophany. Uh, the other thing to note about this is that this passage, 1 Nephi 8, is quoted in Alma 36.22, which is very interesting because it's an example of what is called intertextuality in the Book of Mormon. Intertextuality is when the Book of Mormon quotes itself. And it would be a very difficult phenomenon for Joseph Smith as a fraud to as in just oral dictation without a script or a manuscript there to, to uh, read from, to, to accurately quote something he wrote days or weeks ago. And we need to remember as well that uh, it's, it's very likely, as I'll mention in a minute, that the uh, book of Nephi, first and second Nephi, were translated last, and that Alma was translated before uh, first and second Nephi. So let's assume now that Joseph Smith is a fraud. He's making this stuff up. He goes along dictating Alma 36.22, and then he goes back, dictates First and Second Nephi, and we'll explain why that's the case in just a minute. And, and when he dictates those, he accurately introduces a quotation in First Nephi for Alma to quote after he has already written the book of Alma. Now, you know, a, a, a fraudulent Joseph Smith has to accomplish some very miraculous stuff to be able to do this. So the phenomenon of intertextuality in the Book of Mormon is very interesting in a number of levels. And this uh, particular verse, 1.8, is an example of that. So we have uh, a, a celestial ascent into the open heavens where he receives apocalyptic revelation from God seated on his throne in a throne theophany. Now notice, too, in verse 8, that God is surrounded by concourses of angels. This is classic biblical language for what scholars call the divine counsel or the sod of Yahweh or the Lord. I've got a file there that you can take a look at that uh, 
examines the sod or the divine council in detail and gives some uh, LDS implications of that. So you can take a look at that if you want to pursue that. But this is divine council language. And then we have a very strange thing going on. From the concourses of angels, one of the angels descends from heaven, uh, who is shiny and glorious like the sun. This, the, these descriptions of sun and stars are about the kabod, the glory of these beings. And then we have 12 others follow him who are bright like the stars. Now, at this point in the narrative, we don't know who these people are. And it's not clear that Lehi knew who, who they were at this point. Uh, in 1 Nephi um, 12, 6 to 7, it becomes clear that these are probably referring to Jesus and the 12 apostles. But at this point, we don't, it, it's, it hasn't been made clear to us. So we don't know that for sure. Um, anyway, these are angelic beings described as astronomical phenomenon, stars, moon, sun, things like that. Uh, all of this pops up again in the book of Abraham in another way, but uh, for our, our purposes here, we just need to look that, uh, at the fact that the host of heaven in the Old Testament are frequently described as stars, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So the host of heaven are associated with these astronomical uh, phenomenon that we see in the sky. For example, in Job, the morning uh, stars shout for joy at creation. These are the host of heaven. Now, I've got a file here of uh, a little article on the host of heaven you can take a look at if you want to um, look at the details. But we have a host of heaven a motif also in this vision. So this vision is quite extraordinary in how densely packed it is with ancient Near Eastern motifs. So these, these uh, groups come down to earth. We don't know if it's, an, in, it's, if it's a vision of the incarnation or if it's just a vision of the descent of, of these uh, angelic beings and the theophany of them. Now, at this point, um, they bring uh, Lehi a book in verses 12 and 13. Again, this is another classic Jewish ancient Near Eastern motif. The, the, the first being, the most glorious one, gives Lehi a book and tells him to read it. And when he reads it, he's filled with the Spirit. Now, this is a motif called the celestial or the heavenly book motif, which, again, biblical scholars have come up with this. This isn't a Mormon idea. Um, I've listed a bunch of references in the right-hand column of, of uh, heavenly book motifs found in scriptures. So, the celestial or the heavenly book is uh, given to Lehi. He opens it up and he reads, and, and what he reads from the book is the message that he is supposed to give the people of Jerusalem. This is his assignment then. The, um, the glorious uh, sun-like being gives him this, says, read this, and then he tells the people of Jerusalem what's in the message. If you look in this column over here, you've got a number of uh, books that have been and studies that have been made, both from an LDS and non-LDS perspective. Most recently, just out a couple weeks ago, is Baines's book, The Heavenly Motif in Judeo-Christian Apocalypses. And it's just packed with information about this. It's an excellent study just out from Brill. I got a chance to look at it at the uh, SBL meeting, but I did not get to, haven't got to read it yet. And of course, it's grotesquely expensive because it's from Brill. So he's given this heavenly book, and the contents of the book are summarized in verse 13, as woe unto Jerusalem, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So this is a prophecy of the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem. But there is a positive side to the message as well, and this is very important, and it is reflected in verses 14 to 15, which is called Lehi's doxology. Again, this is a very typical uh, Jewish way to uh, give a little poetic type rendition of glorifying the Lord and praising the Lord and saying how wonderful he is. So Lehi gives it, he, he has this message from the book, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. But his response to this is, great are the works of the Lord. Your throne is in heaven. You have power and goodness and mercy over all the earth. And you have mercy on those. Okay? So in other words, there's more to the message than just destruction. We'll find out what that is in just a moment. But here you've got Lehi then. Um praising the Lord because of what he has read and seen. 
Now, what this tells us is that Lehi understand, understands Yahweh's plan, or sod, or his mystery. Uh, the Hebrew term is sod. And, and when he understands that, he can see the ultimate reject, uh, redemption. He knows what God's plan is. He knows that his people will be saved in the end. And so despite the contemporary despair of Jerusalem uh, plundered and Jerusalem uh, under uh, ba Babylonian vassalage and Jerusalem about to be destroyed, he can still praise the Lord because he sees the plan. He knows the mystery. And this is what's revealed to him from the divine council as recorded in the celestial book. Now, the mercy is also related to the idea of the Messiah, which we'll look at in just a second, which, which pops up in just a moment. Now, at this point, Nephi makes an editorial comment. Basically, he says, uh, I, I'm summarizing what my father hath written, meaning there is a text somewhere of, of Lehi's visions and dreams and prophecies. Uh, we call it the Book of Lehi. And uh, Nephi is summarizing a little bit of this. Nephi is in 17 is only going to account, recount his own experiences, and he's going to abridge or allude to his father's record. Now, this is a very interesting thing in the Book of Mormon because it is an allusion to the lost book of Lehi. What happened was, I think most people are familiar with the story, uh, Joseph Smith began translating the Book of Mormon in the summer of 1828, he managed to translate 116 manuscript pages. Martin Harris wanted to take those pages to his wife to convince her that Joseph was a prophet. Martin Harris believed. His wife didn't believe. Uh, Joseph uh, was told not to let him do it, but in the end relents, lets him take it. The pages are lost, presumably stolen and dis or destroyed uh, by Martin Harris's wife. The Book of Lehi is never retranslated. The translation picks up again when it does a, few, a little while later. It picks up again at Mosiah, apparently, and then carries on through the rest of the Book of Mormon uh, from Mosiah or around Mosiah somewhere, and then goes back, and at the end of the translation of the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi and 2 Nephi are translated, and they're the last books translated in the process. Now that's, of course, uh, non-Mormons and critics say that's, the order of writing. Uh, uh, Mormons say that's the order of translation. But it creates an interesting issue because first and second Nephi aren't aren't uh, had not been translated yet when Mosiah and Alma starts. Now this lost book of Lehi is uh, kind of an intriguing thing. Um, there's I've listed some bibliography over here about what it's what it's all about. You can take a look at those. There's a new book coming out by uh, Don Bradley called The Lost 116 Pages, supposedly coming out in a few months. I don't know anything about it. Don Bradley's a smart guy. I don't know what he's coming up with or what it's all about. But there's some other articles and stuff you can take a look at about both the narrative of how those pages were lost and about, you know, what's in the, uh, you know, do we know kind of what was contained within the book of Lehi. So, after these editorial comments, Nephi gets back to a discussion of Lehi's prophecies. So, Lehi has these visions, and he, he is assigned then by the um, divine council to go out and preach to the people of Jerusalem. He, he gives his message, which testifies of their wickedness. He testifies of what he saw and heard, his own visions, and he testified of what he read in the book which is the, you know, this divine message from, the divine, uh, from God and the Celestial Council. And the Jews mock him. They, they, he's, his message is basically not well received. And that's similar to Jeremiah. Jeremiah did, you know, had some followers, but basically was not well received until his prophecies come true and everybody realizes he was right all along. However, it does add one interesting thing that, that Nephi, uh, Lehi prophesies of the coming of a Messiah uh, who's going to redeem the world. Now, it's not clear if this is the one like the sun in, in 1.9, but in 19, there's a Messiah who's going to redeem the world. And this is the first allusion to uh, the Messiah in the Book of Mormon, and it makes the, Mor uh, the Book of Mormon immediately a messianic book. Now, the heavenly book then that he was given apparently said, talked about the, 
this is a quote, the coming of the Messiah and also the redemption of the world. Now, this implies to me that Lehi did not have knowledge of the Messiah or the redemption of the world up till this point. And it implies that the uh, concept of the Messiah was not clearly or widely understood by the Jews of Lehi's day. And I've got here on the right-hand column in the purple uh, zone, a bibliography of current scholars produced in the last five years or so discussing um, the concept of Messiah within the uh, Old Testament. So very interesting stuff about that. But uh, the, the esoteric revelation that Lehi receives seems to have included the woes upon Jerusalem, but also the promise of the coming of the Messiah and the redemption of the whole world. So this was something, uh, as far as I can tell, it was something new. And the Jews mocked him about it. Now, uh, because of his prophecies, the, the, uh, the people of Jerusalem are angry at him. They, they reject his message. They think he's a false prophet. And that's because there were other prophets like Hananiah who were preaching exactly the opposite and saying that the Lord had revealed it to him. So you have Hananiah saying uh, the Babylonians will be overthrown. Jerusalem will be saved by the Lord, just like it had been in the days of Isaiah uh, when the Assyrians attacked. And then you have people like Lehi comes in and says, no, the city is going to be destroyed unless you repent. And, um, you know, God is angry with you. You need to stop your wickedness and abominations. Uh, the people then see Lehi as a false prophet. And that, in biblical terms, justifies the execution of Lehi. Because false prophets can be executed according to Deuteronomic law. I didn't include the passage there, but it's, it's explicit in Deuteronomy. So, he is essentially now a wanted man who is accused of blasphemy and false prophecy and is on the run. And as we shall see in chapter 2, the Lord is going to have mercy on Lehi and deliver him and save him and send him off on a brand new mission, not to prophesy to Jerusalem, but to carry uh, his family to the new world. And we'll see that then when we take a look at First uh, Nephi 2. Now notice, in summary, the uh, characteristics and features of Jewish esotericism that we find in 1 Nephi 1. We find a temple theophany, the appearance of the pillar of fire at the temple. We find apocalyptic vision where new revelations of, of destruction are revealed to Lehi. We find a celestial ascent where Lehi goes up and visits and sees and participates in the divine council. We see a throne theophany with God seated on his throne, surrounded by his divine council, and that divine council reveals the sod or the mysteries of God to Lehi. Uh, the hosts of heaven come down and bring a heavenly book, and they reveal uh, information about the Messiah. So, so the book is just packed with ancient Jewish esoteric and prophetic lore. It's really a tour de force. It's, it's quite uh, astonishing to see how much is packed in in an elusive way within these verses. But it sets up then the message of the uh, Book of Mormon, which is repentance and the Messiah. And as we progress, we'll see this message unfold in greater detail. So if you uh, want more information, you want to see the notes on this, go to the Mormon Scripture Explorations uh, blog at wordpress.com. And I'll try to work through uh, chapter two in the next day or two. Thanks for listening.